Grace and peace be multiplied to each of you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. What a privilege, honor, and great blessing it is to be here with you to worship Jesus together and to proclaim to you the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you would take your copy of God's word and turn with me to the New Testament book of Ephesians. At the end of Ephesians chapter 3, there are two verses about the God who answers prayer that I would call your attention to. Let's pray first. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise of worship for the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. And for your word that is a lamp for our feet and a light for our pathway. Open our understanding that we may comprehend the scriptures. Give us understanding and we will obey your word and keep it with our whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 record a doxology, a declaration of praise. It reads in the English Standard Version, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. I want to label this message, the God who answers prayer. The God who answers prayer. On one occasion, <clears throat> Donald Gray Barnhouse stood in the pulpit of the 10th Presbyterian Church in Center City, Philadelphia, and shocked his congregation by announcing, prayer changes nothing. But he did not make this statement for shock value. Barnhouse sought to communicate the fact that God changes things, not prayer. That is, prayer works because of the sovereign power of Almighty God, not merely because of the words we say or the promises we claim or the faith we express. You see, Christian living always flows from Christian truth. So one does not best learn to pray by studying prayer. One best learns to pray by studying the God who answers prayer. This is the message of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. In the book of Ephesians, there are two prayer reports, if you will, where Paul tells the church that he prays for them, what he prays for them, and why he prays for them. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, records a prayer for, for understanding. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, records a prayer for strength. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21 that we will consider represent the closing words of this prayer for strength. If I may overview, this prayer begins with the opening appeal in verses 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Verse 16 records the main petition of the prayer. He is praying that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. It is a prayer for strength. Verses 17 through 19 record the intended results of this prayer. What will happen if God answers this prayer? Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then in verses 20 and 21, our text, the prayer closes with a doxology or a statement of praise. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Note, if you will, that the prayer request in this prayer 
are sandwiched in between big statements about God. In verses 14 and 15, Paul describes God as the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And then in verse 20, he addresses God as him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. The very structure of this prayer is intended to teach us that effective prayer is always God-centered. You'll never learn to pray right without simple confidence that God is willing to hear and able to answer prayer. So you should begin your prayers by invoking the greatness of God, and you should end your prayers by praising the greatness of God. I think in many instances, friends, we short-circuit our prayers because we say amen too fast. <laughs> but, but prayer shouldn't end after you have given God your list of requests. Paul shows us here that prayer should end only after you praise and acknowledge and thank the God who is able to answer our prayers. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will answer you, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. You see, the purpose of prayer is not merely the answer you receive. The purpose of prayer is the glory of God. And in this doxology at the end of Ephesians 3, we see that you should not wait till after you receive an answer to the prayer before you praise God. Before he answers, here Paul shows us, before the prayer is finished, you should look up and remember the God who answers prayer. In these two verses that conclude Ephesians chapter 3, there are two big truths here about the God who answers prayer that I want to share with you. The first truth in this doxology is this. God is able to answer your biggest request. God is able to answer your biggest request. Verse 20 says, Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us. This 20th verse is a statement about divine omnipotence. It means that God has complete power over the created world. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27 the Bible says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? In Jeremiah 32, verse 17, the answer is given. O Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth by your mighty power and your outstretched hand. There is nothing too hard for you. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, the angel tells Mary how she will give birth to a son, though she has never been touched by a man. How? For with God, all things are possible. And in Luke 18, verse 27, Jesus himself says that the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. God is omnipotent. He has all power. And in verse 20, we see two ways divine omnipotence works on the behalf of those who trust in Christ. On one hand, Paul says that the power of God is at work infinitely beyond us. It's at work infinitely beyond us. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us. That, that word able simply means the ability to act according to one's will. It's one thing to have good plans, great expectations, good intentions. It's another thing to be able to accomplish what you intend. This is our God. 
He doesn't just think it or say it or plan it. He can do it. The Bible says, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you'll still have an abundance to share for every good work. Jude 24 says God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Our God is able. The text says, now to him who is able. But he rushes to make it clear, friends, that God's ability is not theoretical or hypothetical or ceremonial. God is able to do stuff with his power. What is God able to do? The text says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all you can ask or think. Ephesians 3 and 20 is beloved because of what it claims about the power of God. But the fundamental statement here is about the goodness of God. He says, God is a God of divine power. And then he says, let me tell you what God will do with this almighty power. Hold on to your seats. He says, God will do what you ask. God is willing to hear and able to answer our prayers. In Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. God is able, friends, to do what you ask. I thought you'd be more excited about that. <laughs> well, you, you may be thinking, HB, <laughs> you, you may be thinking, HB, well, what about those burdens, needs, hopes, goals, desires, fears, issues that I, I don't know how to pray about? I don't know what to ask. Look at the verse again. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. The God who is omnipotent is also omniscient. The God who can do anything knows all and he is able to answer the prayers that you don't even have words to articulate. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. God is able to do what you ask and what you think. How much of what you ask and think is God able to do? He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. There is nothing too hard for God. A.T. Robinson said it well, that our highest aspirations are not beyond God's ability to bestow. There is nothing too hard for God. There is no burden that God cannot lift. There is no door that God cannot open. There is no enemy that God cannot defeat. There is no need that God cannot provide. There is no problem that God cannot solve. There is no sickness that God cannot heal. And there is no sin that God cannot forgive. He is able to do all that you ask or think. And he doesn't have to stress, strain, and struggle to do it. Now to him who is able to do, says Paul, far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. Scholars call this a super superlative. Paul strains language to say that God is able to answer your biggest requests, your deepest desires, and your highest expectations. God can save 
your lost husband and make him your spiritual leader. God can fix the problems in your marriage and give you then a ministry to other troubled couples. God can lead a lost child back to himself and use him to be a missionary to those who don't know Christ. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, there is the profile of a king named Amaziah. He took the throne of Judah at the age of 25 and reigned for 29 years. He has a weird epitaph. 2 Chronicles 25 verse 2 says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not with his whole heart. Huh? The chapter goes on to explain. After he took the throne, he avenged his father's death and started building up his military strength. He raised up 300,000 fighting men from Judah and then went to Israel and hired 100,000 soldiers from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God showed up with an ultimatum and said to Amaziah that if you go to battle with these soldiers from Israel, you will fall before your enemies. But if you just trust God, he will overthrow your enemies. Second Chronicles 25 verse 9 tells us Amaziah's response to the man of God. He says, but what about the hundred talents of silver I already paid the soldiers from Israel? That has to rank with one of the craziest questions in the Bible. <laughs> God gave him an ultimatum, do not go to battle with those guys, trust me. And it's like Amaziah said, but I already paid them and I can't get a refund. What, <laughs> what am I to do now? And in 2 Chronicles 25 verse 9, the man of God answers by saying, the Lord is able to give you much more than that. Friend, this is why God is worthy of your complete obedience, your stubborn trust, your unconditional surrender. Because whatever it costs you to do the will of God, God is able to give you much more than that. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. Before I move on, let me tell you that there's not only good news here, there is bad news. Uh, the bad news and the good news is the same news. What is good news for believers is bad news for unbelievers. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. You want Jesus to stay out of your life, he can do far more abundantly than what you ask or think. He will stay out of your life for time and eternity. Scholars debate whether or not the references Jesus makes to hell in the Gospels are literal or figurative. But even if you conclude they're figurative, there's no hope there. Because a symbol just points to an infinite greater reality. As so if the statements about the fires of hell are just figurative, they point to an infinitely greater reality of the doom of one who will spend eternity without God. Friend, before that day, our only hope is to run to the cross and to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And to trust the bloody cross and empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from the judgment of God that is sure to come. And the good news is that when you do that, God will be on your side for life and for eternity. He will do for you far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. The power of God is infinitely at work beyond us, but it is intimately at work within us. Now the hymn says, verse 20, that is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think. Look at the next phrase. According to the power at work within us. There's a play on words here in the original language. The verb 
Abel at the beginning of verse 20 is the noun for power at the end of the verse. The God who is able is himself the power at work within us. What a wonderful assurance. God is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within us. This is good news, friends, because all of us are weak people. No matter how long you've walked with Christ, no matter how much scripture you know, no matter how devoted you are to prayer, no matter how sacrificially you serve, how generously you give, all of us are weak people. The good news is, however, that strength is available so that you can resist temptation and live obediently and serve faithfully and suffer joyfully and witness confidently. And not only is that power available, but what Paul is saying here is that you don't have to wait for God to swoop down from the sky to help. This exceedingly abundantly above all power is at work with in us. The moment we trust Christ for salvation, God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts immediately, completely, and permanently. God is at work in us. Every Christian is a beneficiary of what one of my mentors called the indwelling presence of the life giver king. God himself is at work within us. Amen. And how much power is working in us? It's according to the power. I like that. Not out of power, but according to power. Uh, a celebrity goes to a restaurant with his entourage and leaves a $1,000 tip, and it hits the blog as a big deal. That's no big deal. That's just a celebrity giving out of his riches. But I read this week of a multi-billionaire who just committed a hundred thousand dollars for medical, a hundred million dollars, that is, for medical research. That's not giving out of, that's giving according to. And this is how God gives, not merely out of. He doesn't just give us a tip of his power. He gives according to his infinite, sovereign, omnipotent power. You, you say, well, HB, if all of this is true in verse 20, I don't feel it. At home and at work, in temptation, with the trials that I have, I don't feel like exceedingly abundantly above power is at work in me. To which I reply, good. The promise is not that you'll feel strong, but even if you don't feel strong, the power of God is still real and available and sufficient. I suggest that it is a good thing that you do not feel strong. The stronger we feel, the more self-sufficient we act, but the weaker we feel, the more we lean on God. You might not feel it, but that power is at work. One writer said, that it is as subtle as the forming of a dewdrop, as gentle as the development of a, of a tree, but as lasting as the throne of God. You won't feel strong, but God will give you strength as strength is needed. That's the promise. You see, friends, there are some things you'll never feel strong enough to do in obedience to God. But what this text is saying is that if you walk in obedience, God will make sure that strength meets obedience so that you can accomplish what he is commanding you to do. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes about having a thorn in the flesh, some painful ailment that limited his strength, and he asked God to remove it. God refused, but told him in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, my grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is perfected in your weakness. God is able to answer your biggest request. That's the message of verse 20. Verse 21 
is a second lesson here about the God who answers prayer. Not only is God able to answer your biggest request, God is, is worthy of your highest praise. I suggest that you do not understand verse 20 if you do not embrace verse 21. The two verses go together. In fact, they are linked by parallel language. Verse 20 begins, to him who is able. Verse 21 begins, to him be glory. That is, the purpose of prayer is the glory of God. God's glory is spoken of two ways in Scripture. There is this intrinsic glory of God. God is glorious because God is God. This is not glory. It's not merely one of God's attributes. It's the sum total of all of his perfections. It's the crushing weight of his holy character. It's the blinding light of his divine presence. To say God is glorious is just another way of saying that God is God. But there's also what you might call ascribed glory. This is what Paul is doing here in verse 21. It is the believer's response to the revelation of who God is. And he says, once you experience this God who is able to do far more abundantly than what you ask or think in prayer, to him alone be the glory. The ultimate purpose of prayer is the glory of God. D.A. Carson in his book, Praying with Paul raised a big question. Is God so central in your priorities and in your thoughts and thus in your prayers that you cannot easily imagine asking for anything without sincerely desiring, desiring that the answer would bring glory to God? The purpose of prayer it's the glory of God. What does that mean? Look at verse 21 with me briefly. First, it, the first lesson here is to glorify God alone. Give glory to God alone. To him be glory, says verse 21. So if you win an, an award, a person stands on stage with a list of people to say thank you to, they have a little list so that they don't forget anyone and get in trouble when they get home. But Paul is saying when you receive an answered prayer, there is no list of people to thank. To him give glory. James Boyce said it simply, the power comes from him, the glory must go to him. Why do you think God has saved us? Why do you think God blesses us? Why do you think God uses us? Friends, it is not to make our names great. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Isaiah 6 and 3 says, the angels in heaven sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you should do it all for the glory of God. Give glory to God alone. Secondly, verse 21 says, give glory to God in the church. Give glory to God in the church. To him be glory in the church. Ephesians Chapters 1 through 3 make lofty statements about the church, but there is no more lofty statement than this line in the final verse of chapter 3. God is to be glorified in the church. All of the doxologies or statements of praise like this are addressed to the church. This is the only one that includes the church. Many people feel like the church gets in the way of the glory of God. Here Paul says that the church is essential to the glory of God. God wants to be glorified in the church. The church is to be a platform for the glory of God before the watching world, for God to take sinners like us and make us trophies of his amazing grace. He is to be glorified in the church. Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5. 
Tell us, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you would visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. In creation, we were crowned with glory and honor, but sin marred that. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But by the amazing grace of God, he has taken guilty sinners like us and restored us to right relationship to him through the blood of Jesus, and he makes us a platform for his glory before the watching world. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prays that the church would better understand what is the hope of our calling and what is the immeasurable riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The question, Saddleback, we should always be asking is that when the church is seen by the world, can the world see the glory of God? Glorify God in the church, but also glorify God in Christ Jesus. It's interesting language here. Verse 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. These are stated next to each other. Not because the church is equal to Christ, but because there is such an intimate communion between Christ and his church. Christ is the head, the church is his body. Christ is the groom, the church is his bride. Christ is the shepherd. We are his sheep. Verse 21 is reminding us, friends, that you cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of the church at the same time. But the priority is on Christ. John 1 verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, the incarnation of was the revelation of the glory of God. Jesus was the walking, talking, breathing glory of God on earth. In John chapter 12, before his betrayal, Jesus prays in John 12, 27 and 28, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour, Father, glorify your name. By his own words, Jesus didn't die at the cross merely, if I may say that that way, merely to save us from sin. He died at the cross to glorify his Father by saving us from our sins. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, the Bible says that God who calls light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts so that men might see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to see the glory of God? Look at Jesus. Jesus is heaven's wonder, hell's worry, and humanity's way out of sin, death, hell, and the grave. Paul says then, glorify God alone. Glorify God in the church. Glorify God in Christ Jesus. And finally, glorify God forever. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, in every circumstance, in every generation, Throughout history, this is a reference for time. For all time, in every season and situation, God is worthy of glory and praise and thanks. But what, H.B., happens when history ends and the generations are done and time is consummated? He says, well, then not just give him glory for all generations, but then give him glory forever and ever. There's a verse in Amazing Grace that says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Two big truths here. The first big truth in verse 20 is great news. God is able to answer your biggest request. 
And in light of that, verse 21 says, God is worthy to receive your highest praise. You should praise God alone and praise him in the church and praise him in Christ Jesus and praise him forever. But a succinct and sufficient statement. There's nothing else that needs to be, well, one more thing to be said. It's the last word of verse 21. Amen. 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 This is language taken from the worship of Israel in the Old Testament. When Israel heard truth about God, they responded to truth with an affirmation. They would say, amen. They, they wouldn't just clap. They would say, amen, which means so be it. It is so. That's right. Right on. I know that's the truth. And aren't you glad that's the final word here about prayer? Aren't you glad that Paul doesn't say, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think, we hope, <laughs> maybe, perhaps. Let's wait and see how things turn out. No. He says, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that you ask or think amen, and that he is worthy of the highest praise. He is worthy of glory in the church and in Christ Jesus and forever. Amen. My mother taught me to sing a hymn of the church. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in, for there Jesus saves me and he keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that as we pray, we can do so with this confidence that you are able to do far more. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.